Welcome to episode four of the End of Antiquity. If you're here for the first time, let's get you caught up on where we are. So the year is 532 AD. The Roman Emperor Justinian just survived a major challenge to his rule during the Nica riots. His ruthless command to slaughter 30,000 Roman civilians in the Hippodrome left him as the sole authority of the empire and his opponents dead or in hiding. Capitalizing on this event and needing to secure his ruling legitimacy with that age-old Roman tradition of military conquest, he began planning an expedition to the former Roman province of Africa. It was ruled now by the Vandals, and their king and Roman ally Hilderic had been imprisoned by his cousin Gelimer. After Justinian was rebuffed in his demand that Hilderic be set free or sent to Constantinople, the emperor assembled an invasion fleet and put Belisarius in command of 15,000 Roman troops with instructions to set sail. It's important here to contextualize the PR campaign that Justinian was putting together. When Belisarius landed in Africa, he did so under the flag of liberation, not conquest. His troops were under strict orders to leave the cities and the civilians of Africa alone. In one account, Procopius describes Belisarius ordering two of his soldiers physically beaten after they were caught stealing some fruit from a nearby farm. The message to the people of Africa was clear. We come in peace. We are here to free you from the oppression of your king, Gelimer, and to bring you back under the protection of his grace, Justinian, the Roman emperor. You are a Christian people, and your place is back inside the empire's borders. And it worked, as we will come to see. In any case, Belisarius's fleet set sail from Constantinople in June of 533. There was a huge fear of what they were headed into. There was little to no intel of the location of the fearsome Vandal navy that controlled the western Mediterranean, and it was that same Vandal navy who had in 468 sunk a full Roman army at sea near Cape Bon and put the final nail in the coffin of the west. Now, making their way across the Cyclades and then onto the Adriatic, the Romans stopped in at Sicily to resupply after it was discovered that the Romans' bread rations had rotted and caused 500 soldiers to get sick and die on the journey. Now, Sicily at this time was part of Gothic Italy, under the rule of the Ostrogothic queen regent Amala Suenta, who was a really tight ally with the Romans, and she opened the ports of the island for the fleet. Amala Suenta is going to end up being a very important figure to the events of this story with regards to everything that comes after the Vandals, so file her name away into the back of your mind for later. Now, during this day in Sicily, Belisarius sent his chief aide and our main historian, Procopius, to Syracuse to see what he could find out about the Vandals. And by a stroke of pure luck, Procopius ended up meeting up with a friend of his who was a merchant who lived in Syracuse and who had known him since they were uh, in childhood friends and learned that a sizable portion of the Vandal army and Gelimer's brother Tzazon and the entire Vandal navy was on its way to Sardinia to put down a rebellion started by the governor there. They were completely unaware of the Roman navy's journey or presence. With these details uncovered, Belisarius immediately set sail for Africa. He landed at a place called Caput Vada, about five days south of the Vandal capital of Carthage. Now, before we get to what happened next, I wanted to talk about Belisarius' wife, Antonina. In a highly unusual move, she accompanied the army on its campaign. And during the sea voyage, she ended up actually preserving the commanding officer's water supply by putting it in glass jars and burying it in sand in the cargo hold so it didn't grow algae and spoil, uh, something that happened to the rest of the army. Antonina was a childhood friend of the Empress Theodora, and they grew up together as actresses in the theater, which at this time in Roman society is sort of a way of saying that they were running in similar circles to prostitutes. Belisarius seems to have been smitten with her, and at the encouragement of the emperor and the empress, they ended up getting married. Throughout the histories of this period, Procopius is quick to insinuate that Antonina's presence on campaign was a way for the Empress Theodora to leverage influence over Belisarius, as... Like we said last episode, she was hell-bent on maintaining her imperial status. And this makes sense because she had just survived the Nika riots and was probably very eager to quell any scent of rebellion against Justinian or herself. Regardless, Procopius is very open for his disdain for Theodora, who he felt was really manipulative behind the scenes, and Belisarius' wife Antonina, who he says dominated Belisarius and caused his reputation and respect among the men of the army to suffer. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about their story when we get to Italy. Anyway, uh, coming back to Africa, the Vandal King Gelimer got word of the surprise Roman landing while he was off quelling revolt among nearby Berber tribes, 
and perhaps not understanding what he was up against, he ordered his brother Amatas to take the forces that had been left at Carthage and meet the Romans at the 10-mile marker south of the city, otherwise known as Ad Decimum. Meanwhile, Gelimer himself marched up from the south, hoping to take the Roman army unaware from the flank. As he closed in, he detached a portion of his cavalry force as a garrison and scout to hold sort of a middle approach to the city near some salt flats. This extremely complicated, uh, coordinated maneuvering would ultimately show how easy it was to lose touch and cohesion in the ancient and early medieval military world. Now, while this was going on, Belisarius was busy organizing the first moves against the Vandals. He sent his elite Buccalarian cavalry under command of his childhood friend John the Armenian, who you may remember from the Battle of Dara, up the road toward Carthage. He also sent a group of Huns as a scout party towards the Salt Flats. In both cases, the Vandal forces stationed in those areas had no intel and no advance warnings about the oncoming Roman elites, and that cavalry force of the Romans and the Huns, though they were vastly outnumbered, descended upon the Vandals and crushed them outright, uh, even killing Amatas in the process. As Gelimer marched up the road, he swept aside a small Roman scouting party that Belisarius had sent ahead to discover how his advanced forces had fared in those endeavors. And there, Gelimer came upon the battle site at Ad Decimum and the body of his brother on the road. Reportedly so grieved at his death, Procopius says that when Gelimer saw the corpse of his brother, he turned to lamentations, and in caring for his burial, he blunted the edge of his opportunity, which once lost does not come back. The main Roman column with the infantry came up the road and dispatched the disorganized, demoralized host of the Vandals easily and caused Gelimer to flee the scene to the west. The next day, the gates of Carthage were thrown open, and under instructions from Belisarius not to loot or pillage, the Roman army peacefully entered the capital and brought it back into the empire. Procopius says that the lunch that had been prepared for King Gelimer was enjoyed instead by the Roman commander, and that the Vandal riches were packed up and sent back to Constantinople. But Gelimer was still out there, and after several months of collecting his allies and remaining soldiers, his brother Sazon finally sailed back from Sardinia to join him for one more thrust at the Romans. They attempted bribing away the Hun mercenaries under Belisarius' command, who had proven themselves dubious allies on the journey across the sea, and they also cut the aqueduct to Carthage. Not wanting to wait around, Belisarius seized the initiative and sent his entire cavalry force to confront Gelimer in the west, near the city of Hippo Regius. The Battle of Trichomarum was on. And it is on indeed. Here we are at the Battle of Trichomarum. Trichum Trichomarum. Probably a bunch of different ways you can uh, pronounce it. <clears throat> but uh, this is the uh, Belisarius' uh, cavalry advance against Gelimer's position. Uh, here in the Great Battles of History, playing Cataphract once again, thought I would change this video up and do a little uh, intro to contextualize the battle here and what went on before it. Obviously, the uh, Romans hoping to uh, put the nail in the coffin of the Vandal army, which at this point has been scattered and demoralized after a series of defeats at Ad Decimum. That was about two to three months ago before this. And uh, Belisarius is uh, aiming to stop the Vandals from harassing Carthage, which he has been um, living in and fortifying over the past couple of months uh, after gaining control of the city from the Vandal King Gelimer. Um, the Byzantine, or Roman, should say, fleet put in at the harbor at Carthage as soon as they were able to take control. Uh, that would allow supplies and troops to get in and return to Constantinople. And uh, in general, Belisarius has been uh, building up the infrastructure uh, for the city, for the Romans. And so now he is uh, on campaign again. This scenario is actually a pretty small scenario, as you can see. Not a ton of units. We've got uh, really 10, 12 units here on the Roman side, a little more on the Vandal side. We've got this uh, river here in the middle that uh, one side or the other is going to have to cross to get to their uh, objectives. And uh, the route points um, here are going to be uh, quite low. The, the Romans uh, route at, uh, after accumulating 35, and the Vandals are only going to route um, at 30. So it's going to be a very quick battle, given the number of units, given the low route score and the low army morale of the Vandals. That's what that's reflecting. Uh, there are some special rules here, um, not too many, uh, but basically the Huns, um, I talked about in the sort of lead up to this battle in this video about how the Huns were sort of unreliable allies. They were annoyed that they didn't get to plunder, that they signed on for campaigning uh, with Belisarius and they did not get to plunder any of the towns along the way. 
uh, because they were on a liberation mission, and so uh, their loyalty was questionable. In this particular scenario, they are not allowed to move into the zone of control of a, um, a Vandal unit unless the uh, Romans have twice have, have made the Vandals get twice as many route points as they have themselves. And if the Romans, um, at the end of a turn, if the Romans have accumulated more route points than the Vandals, then the, actual, the Huns will actually switch sides, which would be very bad. Um, so we have to be really careful about how we use the Roman units here. Additionally, um, like I said, Belisarius marched out at full speed with his cavalry. So this is the cavalry force here of, of the army he brought to Africa. Uh, the infantry is bringing up the rear. They're to the east, which is this direction. They're coming up the road. Um, they are, uh, there's a chance every turn that uh, they are able to come on in column formation somewhere along this edge uh, and join the battle, which will be nice for the Romans because uh, having uh, the ability to uh, hold a section or hit a flank uh, will be very useful. Um, that said, they do have the unit advantage, and we'll go over that in a minute. Uh, historically, uh, to talk real quick about how this battle went historically, um, it is said it, by in Procopius's histories that Belisarius and his cavalry charged at the Vandals three times, um, and twice they were rebuffed, but on the third time, with the help of the infantry who had shown up, uh, the third charge ended up breaking the Vandal line. Um, pretty straightforward here, actually. I mean, we've got a line of, of Vandal units, we've got a line of Byzantine cavalry, uh, heavy cavalry, uh, cataphracts, and um, basically we're just going to throw them in there as hard as possible. And I'll show you why that's going to be a good idea when I go over the Vandal forces. But yeah, historically, one charge, rebuffed, second charge, rebuffed, and then Belisarius was like, do it again, third charge. They got in there, they had some infantry help, and they drove the Vandals off. At that point, Gelimer retreated from the field, fled again. He fled to the top of a mountain nearby. He was stuck up there for, I think, 30 or 35 days, something in that range. Uh, Belisarius sent his good friend John the Armenian to go capture um, uh, Gelimer, who in this uh, scenario is here. Um, and uh, in that mission, um, John the Armenian was actually uh, shot and killed by friendly fire from one of his own troops. And uh, this, this was really devastating to Belisarius. They had been friends since they were kids. Uh, Belisarius, um, after finding out about John's death at the hands of one of his own soldiers, Belisarius uh, ended up uh, erecting a shrine for his friend John and paying for its upkeep um, for... Uh, apparently the remainder of his life uh, because he was so distraught over what had happened. Um, in any case, uh, Gelimer was eventually captured, surrendered on the mountain. He was brought back to Constantinople, and uh, Belisarius then got a triumph in the capital. It was the first Roman triumph um, of a Roman general in, in, I think, over a century, a century and a half maybe. It was, it was a long time. Um, I have to look at the exact number. Uh, but Belisarius did get a, a Roman triumph uh, for his conquest of the Vandals, which he accomplished in, in basically two months um, with an ex expeditionary force of 15,000. Um, so that's where all of this ends up. Uh, but uh, let's go ahead and look at the Vandal forces, and I will show you what they're working with. Here's the Vandal army. Uh, we've got the, basically every wing is kind of the same, uh, same force makeup. We've got a lot of these Vandal uh, Lancer cavalry, um, which are sort of light melee cavalry. We know from the Battle of Dara that these are going to get absolutely torn up and chewed up by the Roman uh, cataphracts. Um, so that's why I'm thinking it's a good idea to charge. Um, we do have some Vandal heavy cavalry, uh, as well, this is a, this is Lancer cavalry, but, uh, the other leaders had heavy cavalry. This is, uh, Gara, who must be one, a Vandal lieutenant. As we move down the line, Vandals, again, center wing here, commanded by Gelimer's brother, Sazon. He has just recently returned from Sardinia with his army, more light cavalry, some, uh, some bow armed light cavalry in here as well. Sazon himself here with some Vandal heavy cavalry. So these these units, there's two of them. The Vandals have two heavy cavalry units. They're going to be uh, the ones that uh, the Romans need to watch out for, uh, for flanking maneuvers and so forth. Sazon himself, not a great leader. Uh, and then we come to Gelimer, who is a little better down here. Uh, yeah, he, he's actually much better than and then Sazon. And again, you see the light Lancer cavalry, and then Gelimer himself's got some heavy cavs. So um, there is another rule in this scenario, and that is the the army um, sort of discipline rule. So in Cataphract, armies are either disciplined or undisciplined. The only armies in the game that are disciplined are the Romans and the Persians. Obviously, we don't have Persians here, and that means that the Vandals are undisciplined. Well, what does that mean? Well, that means that any time any unit without bow capability moves more than two hexes closer to an enemy, there's a chance that they go into an uncontrolled advance, meaning they have to move and shock as quickly as possible. The Vandals do not want to be doing that. <laughs> they are uh, not equipped to take the Romans head on. They need to deploy some trickeration, some uh, cleverness. Um, so that's what they're going to have to be wary of. And, and so given that, uh, the Vandals probably are not going to move from this position. They 
uh, you know, if they do move, they're gonna have to kind of move one hex at a time or two hexes at a time. These light cav with the bows, they're allowed to get close and fire, but uh, that's probably gonna be a harassment tactic, not really a path to victory. Uh, and uh, so, so there's that. Now on the bright side, because they are undisciplined, their printed tactical quality rating is actually too higher than what is on the counter. They start the scenario that way. So all of these fives that you see here, um, they're actually sevens, which is pretty good, matches the Roman side. Um, it will stay that way, and, and every time a unit routes here, um, then we'll make a check to see if uh, the army becomes uh, sort of break, their confidence is broken, essentially. So every time a unit routes, we roll against Gelimer's, um, Chariz, uh, uh, the, um, initiative rating, which is five. If we roll higher than five, I believe, uh, then the army no longer has that ability. So, uh, it's going to be kind of unpredictable what happens here, uh, in terms of how the Vandals, how long they're able to stand in and hold it. But that is the Battle of Trichomarum. Uh, so let's get going. Well, something tells me this is going to be a very short game. <laughs> Martinus, uh, and so in the elite uh, command phase, which is where Belisarius gets to issue a command to any leader, he issued it to himself and did a line command across the entire line for a general cavalry charge. Um, Martinus and the associated cataphracts sort of in his wing uh, came in here. They, even with the plus two TQ, immediately routed these uh, Vandal Lancers. Um, they took off, uh, after getting smashed into by the heavy Byzantine, uh, Byzantine force, obviously with the composite bows, they were able to fire before they impacted that put some cohesion hits. It was really disastrous. Um, and now Gellimer is going to be facing off against Martinus next turn. Um, and he, it, it, the other thing that happened was, uh, we rolled each for each one of these when they routed to see if the Vandals lose their plus two tactical quality. When this unit routed, they rolled poorly, and now the Vandal's tactical quality is down to a 5. And the reason that's important is because we have not even done all of the charges uh, across here yet, and uh, we are about to. And that's probably going to leave this Vandal army, uh, run him ragged. Uh, you should see here, Sazon got a real unlucky with the Byzantine archery. As the cataphracts closed in, they fired some arrows managed to uh, do three cohesion hits on him. Uh, so that's not good either. And then uh, over here, the uh, Roman Roman Cav on the right just to kind of took up a defensive position just to shut the door against uh, some sort of like swinging uh, maneuver. Belisari is still down here with his um, cataphracts, uh, his Buccalarii, and then obviously the Huns aren't, are watching essentially, but this is gonna be probably mopped up here pretty quickly. And here is the uh, opening, the, literally just the first command of the game with the cavalry charge. You can see how many Vandal units have just folded light cards, including Gellimer's brother Sazon, whose heavy cavalry could not stand in against the arrows and the impact of uh, John the Armenian here. Uh, they are in full flight, and the Romans are going to want to clean this up as quickly as possible. Uh, maybe get some, uh, if this one here, for example, is free, you can get some ranged uh, shots off on some of these, they'll immediately eliminate them, and that they want to drive the route stuff up as quickly as possible before the Vandals get a chance to sort of reform uh, and counterattack. But uh, before we get to that, we have got to see who the next activation is going to be. So Belisarius used his elite activation to do a general cavalry advance. Now we roll off. There's a, there's a couple of three leaders. There's uh, over here, we've got Gara, and down here, we've got the Hun. So we need to see who goes first. We roll off, and it looks like it is the Vandals, two to one. So uh, Gara is going to go first. Then the Huns, I think with the Huns, I'm just going to move them up to the river line. Uh, obviously, they cannot enter a zone of control right now until we get some route points on the board. So uh, we're going to move them up to the river line and uh, take some pot shots, probably. They're hunting cavalry, so they've got uh, composite bows. So yeah, that's what we're going to do. And uh, we'll go from there. Well, Gara trying to acquit himself well here on the Vandal left. He has ordered his uh, cavalry here to make an attack against this cataphract in a three-on-one uh, we had someone come around the flank here. The, the cataphract turned to meet him, got some bow fire off. This vandal unit came in here from the front, and then Gara himself is coming in from the now exposed flank, trying to get that uh, two-column shift for being a uh, three-to-one ratio in size here. Unfortunately, in the pre-combat, uh, pre-shock tactical quality check, both of these vandal units failed the roll by three, so they've already basically are going to rout more than likely <laughs> from, from this attack, so uh, not looking good. The vandals made of paper mache in this scenario and the uh, Romans just an absolute steel wall. Uh, let's resolve this combat and I'll show you what happens. Well, they did it. They managed to route the uh, Roman cataphract here. Um, 
all of these units uh, really close to breaking. Basically, it was one good charge from the Romans here turning and, and uh, going this way. Unfortunately, they're out of command range right now from uh, Belisarius, and I believe they're out of command range from uh, John the Armenian. So uh, not great positioning maybe there by me for the Romans with the command structure. Uh, Gara now free to try and a continuation here, which would be pretty devastating um, to eliminate this unit here early on. Uh, but the bright side here is that the, the Huns can try and trump in. We'll see if that's possible. Sadly, not able to make it happen. That's good news for the Romans. They can move. Um, they can move Ferris up potentially and get a shot off. If they can do damage to really any of these units here, they'll send them packing. So uh, we're gonna get on with the rest of the turn. I'll probably check in. I mean, the game might end here on this first turn, but I'll check in uh, when uh, I've gone through a couple more commands for both sides. Well, that might be the fastest great battles of history scenario I have ever played. We did not even get through a full turn. Uh, in the game before the Vandals were absolutely crushed. Uh, this is even shorter than Casilinum, which is one of the first videos I did on this channel, which was a Frankish uh, wedge attack against uh, Roman Heavy Cav, which was designed to be imbalanced. But this one, by far, the Vandals just absolutely hammered, as it should be. In fact, um, this is maybe a little easier than history. The the Romans not even forced to charge more than once. The the initial elite activation from Belisarius to send the line forward uh, just cut through the Vandals like butter. Um, I can take you through the very short highlights. Obviously, you saw what happened down here. Gara managed to uh, rout one of the cataphracts. We had some effective arrow fire from Ferris and the Huns who moved up and managed to rout um, a Lancer unit here. Uh, Sunicus moved up getting ready for the next turn. And uh, these uh, sort of stationary kind of watchful uh, cataphracts didn't really have much to fear or do. Uh, in the center, um, John the Armenian's units, as you can see, routed essentially 50% of this line. Um, Sazon himself was uh, essentially attached to a bunch of different units who all routed. Um, there was there was kind of a, a, a mix up here where a unit routed through two units and then that put cohesion hits and then one of those cohesion hits forced another route and uh, it was just a kind of a cascading failure all across the line. I will the, the only real good thing that happened here was this unit here that's routed actually made a flank attack against John the Armenian this turn. Managed to put enough hits on him. Uh, that a uh, some ranged fire uh, from this light cab unit managed to rout John the Armenian's unit here, but it ultimately it doesn't really matter. This is going to be a fairly simple rally when it came to John's turn. And, you know, there's really only two Roman units here. Uh, the, the Lancers, even on the flanks against the Roman cataphracts, were still, well, not only were they taking um hits in the combat like normal but every single time i tried to get on the flanks with the vandals and they had to tactical quality check they were rolling like eights and nines missing their tactical quality by like three or four points so they were essentially eliminating themselves by doing the charges um their their uh, constitution not very high they were scared as they uh, came in against the famed heavy cavalry here of the byzantines uh, and then obviously uh gelimer's wing entirely disintegrated uh these two units here after routing the initial pairs on the on the wings on the flanks um they then turned when it became time for martinus to go they turned and charged ahead into the rear of the fleeing um, Lancer cavalry and all of those Lancer cavalry failed their tq checks on the charge so they just vaporized Here's the final final look. We have uh, five uh, light melee cavalry from the Vandals and one of their heavy cab units uh, completely destroyed. 31 route points. The Romans took zero. We didn't even get through turn one. Belisarius didn't even have to move. He's still standing in a starting command position looking on. He gave one order and that basically destroyed the Vandals. The Buccalarians get a rest this time. They don't have to jump into action like they did at the Battle of Dara. So there you go, Battle of Trichomarum, uh, short and sweet, devastating to the Vandal effort, and uh, pretty much reflects what the Romans did to North Africa in the span of two months. Absolutely embarrassed and decimated the Vandals, once one of the feared um, barbarian non-Roman tribes of the region. Uh, the king in flight, his uh, his brothers dead in, his, in the historical Battle of Trichomarum, Sazon, I think, was killed. Uh, along with Amatas at the Battle of Adecimum, so the, the Gelimer line, not great. The other thing I should mention here is, um, and then I forgot to mention in the earlier parts of this video, uh, is that Gelimer, when the Romans landed and he got word that uh, the Romans were in North Africa, he immediately ordered the execution of Hilderic um, as sort of a, 
you know, a punishment or um, sort of taking away the option for the Romans to uh, to free him. And that is why the Romans ended up taking control of Africa. There was some dis uh, discussion that maybe when they liberated North Africa, uh, Hilderic being released from prison, he would govern uh, Carthage on behalf of Justinian as sort of a, a vassal state. But obviously when, when they landed and Gelimer ordered Hilderic murdered, uh, there was no... Um, Vandal nobility uh, there to assume the throne, and so the Romans just uh, took it for themselves. Um, the next video, so we're going to have a brief interlude with the end of antiquity. I'm going to do a video about uh, reading recommendations, very short. Uh, I got a lot of questions about that over the last couple of weeks. And then I've got to figure out a way to tackle Italy. Um, so much of this period is defined by the Gothic Wars in Italy. It was a war that lasted um, essentially 20 years. Uh, lots of back and forth, crazy things happened there. A lot of things happened. Um, so if I were to do a video as I have been doing on the Gothic Wars, uh, we would, I would be doing this, this project until I was dead. Um, so I'm going to take probably a different tack and, um, we're going to explain Italy through gameplay only likely, uh, playing Belisarius, the Byzantine Empire Strikes. Uh, and I will play a little bit of that game, get us to the point in history where the Gothic Wars took place, and hopefully I'll be in a spot to be able to recreate the Gothic Wars historically and uh, sort of give you the main points of that campaign, some of the stuff that happened, some of the uh, internal politics of the Roman army, um, and there's quite a bit. And uh, we can wrap all that up in a single video or possibly a series of gameplay videos on that game. And then we can move on to the end of Justinian's reign and into um, Justin II, Phocas, Maurice, and sort of the end of the 6th century as we get ready for the rise of Islam. Hope you've been enjoying this so far. Uh, this one, <laughs> maybe not the most exciting, but I'm glad I paired it up with a little bit of historical context for you. And uh, I'll be back soon with episode, well, with the interlude and within uh, episode five.